Bienvenidos. Welcome to the 47th annual convening of one of the most enriching experiences in our community. The celebration of diversity and traditions known as Tucson Meet Yourself. I am Supervisor Betty Villegas, and on behalf of the Pima County Board of Supervisors and all the residents of our beloved community, I am happy you can join us. Pima County is a mix of ancestral cultures with lifetime and longtime residents and our new arrivals, all sharing the air, the land, and the history of the beautiful Sonoran Desert. Lucky for us, we also share the foods, dances, music, manual arts, and rituals of dozens of different cultural communities and folk groups, all of which call Pima County home. Every year, Tucson Meet Yourself, sometimes referred to as TMY, is our community's shared big tent where we discover, respect, and celebrate each other. Congratulations and thank you, Tucson Meet Yourself organizers, for adapting this year's 2020 festival to the new public health precaution guidelines. This year, TMY has reframed the event to include a socially distanced virtual experience that offers each of us an opportunity to be connected while remaining safe. There is so much beauty, strength, and resilience in every one of our cultural traditions, and I encourage you to join us in support and celebration of them all. Please enjoy all the offerings, and remember, we will get through all the challenges because we are Pima County strong. Welcome to this program, part of the 2020 edition of To Submit Yourself Reframe. I want to take this moment to thank our sponsors. Without their generosity, none of these wonderful offerings would have been possible. First, our major sponsors, Pima County, the City of Tucson, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Arizona Commission on the Arts, the Arts Foundation for Tucson and Southern Arizona, and the University of Arizona College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, and the Southwest Center. In addition, I want to thank our presenting sponsors, businesses that stuck with us even in these difficult times. Thank you to Cox, Tucson Electric Power, Visit Tucson, Desert Diamond Casino, and Chicanos por la Causa. Enjoy the program. Good morning and welcome to Tucson Meet Yourself Reframed. Today we begin a series entitled Traditions Tuesdays. Each panel discussion has been curated to honor and share the traditional knowledge in our region, the Southwest and the US-Mexico border corridor. Through the voices and experiences of traditional artists and community members, you'll learn about distinctive cultural expressions, how they are preserved and how they endure and thrive in everyday folk life. Today, I am deeply honored to bring you our first panel discussion entitled Clay Stories, Ha Ha Adakam, One Who Makes Pottery. This conversation will be facilitated by my friend and colleague, Bernard Siqueiros. Bernard Siqueiros is an enrolled member of the Tahana Atham Nation, recently retired as the curator of education at Himdaki, the Tahana Atham Nation Cultural Center and Museum. His experiences also include cultural center and museum project administration, counselor, researcher, program coordinator, and education administrator in education entities on and off the Tahana Atham Nation. He is an avid and exceptional photographer and has contributed immensely to the tribe's photo documentation efforts at Himdag Ki. Bernard will be joined by artist Ruben Naranjo, Ruben first learned Tahana Atom pottery from his grandmother, Mary Neblena Lewis. Later, he was guided by Alicia Bustamante of Shugoshki, Sonora, Mexico, 
and helped by Annie Manuel of Hikawan, Arizona, to make utilitarian terracotta ollas and white clay friendship pots using colored clay slips and organic paints. A member of the Arizona tribe working in clay, being a potter recalls the first autumn potter, the creator, Iito, who first created the autumn from red clay, water, sand, and fire. Welcome, Reuben. We are also joined by Kathleen Vance. Kathleen, also known as Kathy, is of the Tohana Atham and San Carlos Apache lineage and calls Southern Arizona desert home. Although she grew up in Tucson, she moved to the main reservation as a teen and began her foundation in the Tohana Atham nation. Kathy has been culturally influenced by a community member of people who respect and value the Hin Dag, Autumn ways of life. In 2000, with other women folk, Kathy began working with Alicia Bustamante of El Bajio community located in northern Mexico, which historically is an autumn country. Alicia has been one of the few remaining Tahana Atom potters. With Alicia, Kathy learned the basic fundamentals of anvil and paddle method. Alicia also encouraged Kathy not to give up, reassuring her that great potters have humble beginnings and that each setback is actually growth in this tradition. After Alicia suddenly and unexpectedly passed away, she met Ruben Naranjo, who became a resource and mentor to her. For the past 14 years, under his teaching and guidance, she continues to produce utilitarian pottery such as cooking vessels, water ollas, seed jars, and effigy pots. Welcome, Kathy. We started this conversation in 2016, four years ago, when SFA and the Tahana Atham Cultural Center, under the directorship of uh, Bernard, supported a six-week artist residency with Ruben and Kathy. The intention of the residency was to rekindle the spirit and to keep the tradition of pottery making alive. The residency ended with a public and community program, the first gathering of potters from Salt River Pima Maricopa communities and the Tohono O'odham villages at the cultural center. And today we are happy to continue this conversation with you in celebration of Tucson Meet Yourself. And with that, I'd like to ask Bernard to um, lead us through a land acknowledgement. Uh, okay, first of all, I'd like to thank Leah and the Southwest Folk Alliance for uh, the planning and providing me this opportunity to be a part of this presentation. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing what will be discussed. So um, we as uh, all of them, uh, have always considered ourselves to be from the area that we're in today. In the map that we have uh, showing um, our nation today, uh, the Tohono O'odham Nation is the second largest in the nation in the United States. Uh, but the map that we that we have on, on, on video is a map of not only our nation today, but of our Aboriginal lands that, that extend much further than what our nation is today. Uh, archaeologists, uh, historical documents, and um, our stories place us in areas outside of what our nation's boundaries are today. Um, we had all of them that lived along the rivers, the San Pedro, the Santa Cruz, the Gila, the Salt, all the way down to the Colorado River. Uh, those people that lived along the rivers, rivers were primarily farmers, uh, di diverting waters off of those rivers to grow crops. Uh, the people in the center of our lands were the Tohono O'odham, the desert people, who were also farmers of the desert, uh, using rain runoff to irrigate their fields. Um, the third group of autumn were the autumn who lived to the far regions of our lands, and these people were the nomadic hunters and gatherers that we refer to as Hiachat autumn. 
And so to give you a perspective of our lands, our lands uh, extended much further than what we have today. Uh, it was mentioned earlier about communities in Mexico. Uh, our lands extended down into Mexico. And so for many, many years um, uh, until the, the uh, Gaston purchase uh, that was made in, in the mid 1800s, uh, all of this land was considered autumn Jewitka or autumn land. And, it, and for many people, it still is. Uh, the, the international boundary that was created was not, uh, was not our idea. And so uh, we still have people that live down in what is now considered Mexico or Northern Mexico. When this idea uh, of this presentation was presented to me and uh, I began to reminisce, I guess, about my personal connection to haha or pottery. And the connection was uh, very strong because of my grandmother. Uh, my grandmother was uh, haha.com. She was a pottery maker. She was an avid pottery maker. And um, so I began to reminisce uh, as a child uh, the things that I remember uh, about my grandmother and her pottery. And what came first was um, uh, an area that she referred to as her kohre. Uh, kohre in our language means fence. And she had an Okatia fenced off area uh, near her home that was her workplace, the place where she made haha -ha or pottery. And uh, I remember it being very neat and clean. And I remember it containing or having uh, uh, an assortment of, of uh, rocks for shaping and for polishing. I remember the the shelves of, of pottery that she had made that were drying and, and preparing for firing. Uh, I also remember that she had a, a little shade in one section of her, of her work area uh, that she would sit under sometime if the sun was too warm or too hot. But under the shade also, she had buried in the ground three large haha. -ha. Uh, and in these uh, large haha -ha were clay that she had she had prepared, uh, and they were there for her her use. And as children, we would often go in there, and uh, she would allow us to take clumps of clay to make our 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 toys. Mm -hmm. We would make uh, we would sculpture, I guess, dinosaurs and horses and men and 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 things of that thing of that nature and then she would she would ask us to place them aside to let them dry and that she would fire them whenever she was ready to fire her pots when she was ready to fire her pots she would send us out to collect um cow pies we call them cow droppings that she used as insulation on her fire then she would fire her pots and she would include the little toys that we had made or the little figurines that we had made uh, in her firing. So that, that idea came to me when I began to think about my, my grandmother. And then I began to think about the fact that ha 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 or pottery were, were throughout our home. Uh, the pots that she made were used to cook beans on an open fire and I tell you the best tasting beans ever are beans that are cooked on an open mesquite fire in a pot or in a clay pot or a ha. Um, we had a ramada outside of our home like most like most homes at the time did. Uh, it was an outdoor um, kind of gathering area uh, for family um, and, and, and under this ramada or this watto, uh, there was a, a pot that sat on a, on a mesquite stump and wrapped in, gunny, in a gunny sack and uh, it had water. And this was our, our, our drinking water. And as, as we played in the hot desert and we would get thirsty, we'd come to the Ramada into the shade and we would dip water from this ha. And it was again, the best tasting water ever. And then we would, we would sprinkle the, the burlap bag that covered the, the, the pot 
to keep the water cool. Um, I also remember that um, whenever one of us had a birthday, uh, my, my grandmother would give us or give the parents uh, probably a flawed uh, ha that, was, uh, that she had made that maybe had a crack or something. And she would give it to our family to, to decorate and to fill with candy and to hang on a tree and to, to break it as a piñata. And so pots were very much a part of my, my upbringing, my, my early years. Uh, as I got older and began to uh, explore the desert a little more, uh, moving further and further away from, from my home, I would often see shirts or pieces of pottery out in the desert. So I knew that uh, pottery was a very much a part of our hymnduk our way of life as all of them. And so um, I guess I wanted to ask Ruben uh, in all of his studies, if he can maybe discuss a little bit about um, um, the origins or when, when did the autumn of first start making pottery? So um, <clears throat> I'm gonna do a little bit of reading here. So, and uh, just to provide the intro. So the history of Tona autumn pottery making is grounded in mythology. Itoi or Hukyutawunak, which means elder brother, was the first autumn potter who, in most creation stories, created the autumn from clay, water, and fire. The very act of pottery making recalls this creation every time an autumn potter sits down to create. According to the anthropologist Bernard Fontana in his publication, Papagoyan Pottery, the autumn pot historically did not have a curved lip at the top of the pottery form. The modern pottery form was influenced by Mesoamerican tribes, such as the Tlaxcaltecos, a Southern Mexican tribe that served as guides, animal keepers, cooks, and burden barriers, bearers to the Spanish explorers, and more notably, Father Eusebio Quino, as they made their way up north to Autumn Hatuerga, or Autumn Lands. In addition, the incorporation of organic temper, such as grass or um, sometimes uh, cow manure and later uh, 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 horse manure was also introduced by the Southerners. This organic inclusion made the clay body stronger, just as hay or grass is used to stabilize and strengthen the adobe bricks. They were the first to introduce these new ceramic technologies to the Otham people. The traditional method and use of paddle and anvil pottery making also had its origin in the South. According to Malcolm Rogers in his publication, Yuma Indian Pottery, as a group of U.S. Tech and Native people migrated North, they brought this technology up with them from the South. The Native Americans that used and use the paddle and anvil technique today in the American West are the human speaking people of the Colorado River area in Baja and Southern Native California, such as the Peeposh, Kawiya, Kumiai, and Autumn peoples. Interestingly enough, is the fact that Hopis, another U.S. Tech and speaking people, do not use the paddle and anvil method. Instead, they use another uh, uh, method for making pottery, which is called coil and scrape. This process involves using clay coils and a, scra and a scraper, uh, possibly a corn cob or a piece of gourd to build the pottery vessel. Our purpose here today is to share our cultural knowledge, all the while ensuring that this ancient art continues to be practiced. Thank you. So now I'm gonna go through the formation of the pot and how it's put together. And um, we're gonna end this demo with just me putting a coil on here and showing how the wall is beginning to form. Um, so basically the pot is started by taking some clay, creating a ball, depending on how big you wanna make your pot. And they would take old older pots that they had, uh, usually, Pots that had no use anymore, cooking pots that had maybe had holes in them or had rims broken or were cracked. Um, so they would take the clay and make a little round ball um, and they would set it down on their work 
area, and I like to use muslin. Muslin wasn't used historically. It's another introduction that we've incorporated into Ottoman pottery making. Um, the, the, the clay, uh, what uh, I've heard a lot of people call it a tortilla because it looks literally like a tortilla because it's spread out in a round form on the ground in your working area. So it'd be made into like a big pancake or a big tortilla. And it would be, they, they would use rocks to have formed the flatten out the, the tortilla. Then it would be taken and, uh, excuse me, they would take uh, the oil they were going to use or the clay pot and they would turn it upside down and they would use wood ash or dried clay, powdered clay, and they would cover the top of it. So that would keep the, the clay from sticking to the oil. Then they would take their clay tortilla and they would lay it on the bottom of the clay olla. Um, they would use their paddle to flatten it out and make it more rounder. Um, they would use their stones to make it flatten out to give it a good thickness that would support the pot that they were making. Um, the thickness on the walls, it depends again exactly what you're doing, what you're going to make. Uh, some pieces were for um, just simple things and they didn't really have thick walls. Other things were made for cooking so they would be thicker or to hold water. So once that uh, form was made and it was to the satisfaction of the potter, they would probably just take a, a stick uh, or something sharp and they would just go around the edge creating a base. If you're using something that's not like a knife or a clay knife or something, it's going to probably come out pretty truncated, but pretty much uh, straight as, as, as straight as they could make it. Then it was allowed to dry out in the in the in the shade uh, in the sun. Some people dry them in the sun. I don't do that because it has a tendency to crack it. But some women have clays that that could support that. And they would be allowed to dry so it's stiff enough that it holds itself up. So this is stiff enough to hold itself up. So typically you can hold and support another clay coil, the very first one. So when the ladies were ready, they would stick their stiff, dry base into one of their, either their hakut or their little uh, hill of sand that they would use. So they would get some clay. And then they would begin to form their um, coil. Historically, the women didn't roll their coils on anything. They would do this, work from the bottom down, and allow gravity to stretch out the coil. This clay is really soft, so I'm going to roll a coil on this. A lot of people make big coils. I do big coils, but sometimes you just have to do thin ones, small ones, I mean. And it also depends on what you're doing. So the next step was to take probably, historically, they probably took the corn cob, wet it, and they would serrate the, the edge of the area where the coil was going to connect. Again, today I just use a ceramic serrated tool. I'll take the, the, the serrated tool and I'll score the edges. So now I'm going to get a little water and I'll put some around the edge. And then we'll put our coil down. One of the other things that a lot of us started using are these little ceramic turntables. They're so easy to use because a lot of times the ladies would just keep the pot stationary. But with the ceramic wheel, we can turn it however we want to and we can guide the whole process. So the next thing I would do is start to 
con uh, conjoin the first coil to the bottom base. And I usually start in the, in the, in the middle. I take my thumb, I wet it, and I just uh, start bringing the coil down into the, the wall of the, the base. Okay, so now I've uh, pressed the clay down all on the inside if you want to look in there to see what it looks like. Now I'll go from the outside and bring it in. Doing the same thing, just using my thumb, forcing the clay from the coil down into the base. Okay, now the bottom has been done. It's not going to look perfect. You know, this is just the first step. So the next thing I would do is I take my serrated uh, scraper. Again, historically, we use a gourd scraper, and they would begin to bring these together more evenly. I would use this one better. I did the inside. Now I'm going to do the outside. When I do the outside, I like to come from the, the top down. This one, I in the inside, I like to come from the bottom in. By using the serrated scraper, it allows for an even uh, uh, pressure on the outside. It also helps... Uh, reduce air bubbles. Air bubbles are very, very dangerous because they create pockets of air in the wall and uh, when you fire them, they explode and they create big old blowouts in the pot. So I'm moistening the inside and that's to allow the, the, the scraper to flow easily over the surface and it, doesn't, it, it, it limits the drag on the surface of the clay because the clay is still very sticky. Then I'm going to go to the outside and do the same thing. So the next part is I'm going to take my fingers and I'm going to start uh, squeezing the coil to start forming the wall. So the next part is I'm going to take this my metal flat metal edge scraper and I'm going to start and smoothing it out. Okay, now I'm going to do the outside. Coming up from the bottom up. Most Native American tribes practice what we call coil and scrape. And literally, it's just that. You put on a coil and they use a scraper to create the wall. That's coil and scrape. This is paddle and anvil. Uh, paddle and anvil pottery is basically that paddle and the rock, or whatever form you want to use, is the anvil. A lot of the Yantam women would have different size shapes and, of anvils. Some of them would be really flat for the bigger pots. It would be able to support the inside of the wall. Some of the other ones when were curved, like this one was more curved. They would moisten it. This has got clamps, so I gotta clean it off a little. It would moisten their paddle. And then they would take their anvil and the paddle. The anvil goes on the inside and the paddle goes on the up. And this would be used to compact the clay and make the wall, the walls more conformation. These are still a little bit rough. Can be uh, uh, made much more straighter uh, after this is dried out a little bit. It needs to stiffen a little bit. It needs to stiffen up to support the next coil so that now it would be allowed to sit for a while and dry. In the Arizona desert, probably take no more than 10 minutes. 
And there's some areas of tea that need to be going over with again with the paddle. Using your hands as a kind of a an uh, anvil and using this as kind of a paddle. So once uh, this is finished and it was gotten to my desired thickness, maybe scrape this out, maybe even it out a little bit on the edge so to make it straight for the next coil, it would be allowed to dry and stiffen up so that the next coil could be put on and the whole process starts all over again. Over and over and over until it terminates in a rounded curved lip of the mouth. So when that was done, the clay pots were usually dried in the, in the shade, allowed to slow dry. And when they were, right before they were completely dry, or leather hard as they call it in studio ceramics, and that typically is when the walls are stiff, stiff, but they're still cool, you can put your hand on it and it feels cool. That's the stage that we want to do the next process, and that's the burnishing. The burnishing helps close up the little tiny holes, the micro holes that you can't see. It also helps to bring the clay paste up and it creates a sheen on the outside. Some of the really highly burnished pots that you see from the Pueblo Indians, that's what they do. They use a burnishing um, stone to create a high polish that almost looks like it has a, gla or a glaze on it. So this is a more historical um, burnishing stone. This one I got in the Santa Cruz. And I just, with handling and just kind of doing something like this with another stone, I've created a flat surface on it. Uh, so now it's smooth and I can use it to burnish the surface of the pot. They add a little bit of water on it and then they would go like this over it over and over and over and over and over and over on the inside too again it helps bring out the the clay paste and it helps compact the temper which is usually sand into the inner core of the wall and then again helping to create a sheen on the surface a lot of us today use a lot of polished uh, excuse me uh, tumbled rocks this is the tumbled crystal rock and I like this one because it really helps with high burnishing. Same process, uh, moisten it a little bit and just going over and over and over and over. So I know some potters just spend four or five hours burnishing their pots, trying to create that sheen on it. That's basically it. Uh, Ruben, you, you you talked about other tribes that have that that have a tradition for making pottery, mm -hmm. and I know that um, um, archaeologists today have been able to kind of um, study these pieces of pottery that they find to 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 determine where material came from to, to try to determine migration uh, of of native peoples. Um, and and so, and in in my in my experiences going out and finding pottery, um, I guess I have always had this question: What characteristics indicate that it it is an autumn pottery and not Hopi or Zuni or or other kinds of pots pottery that other tribes make? Well, typically the the majority of autumn pottery was utilitarian where. Uh, right. pots for making, excuse me, for storing water, as you described earlier in your introduction, pots for cooking, uh, pots for making uh, which is a uh, saguaro syrup that's uh, done after the harvest of the saguaro fruit. Um, there's also um, pots that were used as canteens um, for uh, parching corn, parching nut, uh, seeds and nuts. Um, and we'll, well, I think we'll get into that uh, later as we discuss right. the different forms. Um, and usually the, uh, one of the things that uh, has typically uh, characterized autumn pottery is a carbon streak. Uh, I don't know if you notice when you pick up a pottery shirt, if you look at the inside of the wall, it's right. usually black and, and right. the right. anthropologists call that a carbon streak. Okay. It's the grass that was used as a temper. In the, ah. in the pottery 
that hasn't been completely burned out. Right. So when it fires, it leaves a carbon streak on the inside. That's a good indication that it's Anthem pottery. And I have noticed that carbon streak in many of the shirts that we see out, mm -hmm. out in the desert. Yep. Um, I know that, that Kathy makes utilitarian pots. I mean, she encourages that the pottery that she makes, uh, she encourages the people to use them as, as cookware. And so I wanted to ask Kathy, um, uh, what, how does she understand ha'a to be um, part of our himadak, I guess, or part of our way of life as autumn? If you could discuss that a little, Kathy. Our connection to pottery goes way back, and, and as Ruben shared, to the beginning of time for us, as we we understand that we were created from pottery. Um, but also um, for us, when um, our children are born, there it's it's a sacred ceremony that we have for them. Or uh, and and I'm really hoping that the the younger generation still do. Um, but it's it's uh, it's called you know the the beat hook chita, which is to to give your child. Um, clay, the taste of clay, and that helps to um, become, uh, it's a strong bond with um, our, our land and our plants, uh, our animals, and then it also helps guide our children. So for me, um, when we talk about pottery, it's not just a vessel. It goes way, way um, deep into us as autumn, as desert people. Uh -huh. Um, you know, so, so, um, I was always, uh, when I first learned to work with, uh, work with clay, you know, um, utilitarian wear was the only type that I knew. And so it's always been, um, I, I started to learn, uh, especially from Ruben, that um, there's other types of pottery, which is, you know, more towards ornamental. Um, but with, for us, um, utilitarian, um, there's so uh, few potters for us as a tribe of uh, 30,000 plus, I would say there's only uh, um, maybe a dozen utilitarian potters. Um, but people still remember how it tastes, uh, the food tastes and the water tastes in, in, in our vessels. And that's what encourages us to move forward for the next generation to make sure that the next generation understands and knows because we all go and we, 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 we gather our own clay and we process our own clay and we fire our own clay so it's not like it's purchased from anywhere. That's the thing that is really, um, that we really want to make sure that our next generation uh, knows. And so utilitarian wear, there's the, now it's, we're known as Don Autumn, we're known for our basketry. But before I've, I've heard of individuals um, who have shared with me at, at different gatherings how they remember um, the sound of the paddle hitting the um, clay early in the mornings and it would echo in, the, in their villages. And um, you, don't, you don't hear that very, very much today. So that's how important it is for us to be sharing this is that, you know, we still, we're still making and we're still creating these vessels and it's just there isn't enough of us so that um, for them to be around. But our, our goal and I, I think my personal goal is to make sure that there is one in each house that they can share with their family because it, it does have a different taste. Uh, um, an earthen taste and, and it's just it's a it's a beautiful thing. So. 
Um, I'm not sure if I answered your question, Bernard, and That's I think fine. I did. That's fine. We, we, we'll continue that discussion. But you, you brought up another memory I had of my, my, my grandmother. Uh, she would, uh, she had a place in the hills near her home uh, where she would, where she would get the red clay that she needed for her pots. And so this is, this was her spot and she would go there uh, up, up the hill and, 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 and get the clay that she needed and put it in a large bucket and put that bucket on her head and then come walking down the hill and, and bring it down and, and prepare it. And then she would send us out to the corral to bring horse manure and, and she always had sand. So, so she had this process that she used and she made these pots for utilitarian uses. But I also remember the tourists that would come also and, and would buy pots from her. You know, and so she 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 will she sold them to them to make to bring an income, but so there was that there was that making pottery for use in the home, but also making pottery for uh, bringing income into the home. So so I guess one of the things we had thought or discussed earlier was we wanted to discuss a little bit about that evolution that we saw from people making utilitarian pots to making ornamental pots to sit on somebody's shelf. Can you, can you, you or Ruben discuss a little bit about that or your thoughts on that? Um, My thoughts, uh, go ahead Ruben and then I'll share well, after. What I was gonna do is I wanted to go back a little bit into what Kathy said and then I'll, I'll answer your okay. question. Okay, that's fine. Um, the the ceremony that uh, Kathy was talking about the bitok chuta, yeah, that is kind of an awesome blessing for um, newborn children, so that people understand what that really is and how important it is for uh, us as uh, human beings to know that that's uh, our place of origin in the ground or the jewet. And uh, um, I just wanted to add that to what she was saying. Also. Have you, excuse me, Ruben, have you also heard it as, as kind of a, an autumn baptism? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, yeah, yeah, it is an autumn baptism. I use blessing. I'm sorry. Well, that's fine. Yeah. No, it's, it's both. Yes. It's yeah. a blessing and a baptism, and it's a way to strengthen mm -hmm. uh, that child in the very so the beginning. Other, the other thing I wanted to add is I've done a lot of traveling into Sonora, visiting relatives while I was doing my research for my graduate degrees. But the one thing I noticed when I would, when a friend of mine and I, we would travel into Sonora and she was often my companion, is that we would travel into these little towns that used to be autumn communities, like for instance, uh, Okitoa. Mm -hmm. And I understand the autumn called the Hukito in autumn. Yeah. And all around the old Ch Aquino mission churches were, you know, residences of primarily 99% of what I called Mexican mestizos. And, but the one thing that I always would notice that I don't think anybody else would ever would is that there's pottery shards all over. Oh yeah. And that to me signifies, you know, the origin of these communities as, as officially autumn communities in right. Caborca too, which, used, which was founded for the missionization of the autumn people. All around that church in the back, there's pottery shards. That shows that we were there. And that shows right. the present generations that we're still there. Because we recognize those, the, and I've had them, uh, fellow Mexican friends that would say, "Oh, that was created by old Mexican people," but if you look back in the history, not only not just the oral, but the documentation, the only the only people that were making pottery were the author. Uh -huh. I, to the best of my knowledge, I've never run across any documentation say that they were produced by Mexican mestizos. They were made by the author. And to me, that is such a strong uh, indication of our presence, even yeah. though most of those towns no longer have uh, often, well, I call them pueblos because they're little towns. They don't have any more often people in them. Only the bigger cities like Caborca and Sonoita and Peñasco. Uh, right. And that's what I wanted to add. Okay. And your question was again, I'm sorry. The transition from, um, from, um utilitarian to ornamental pot, pot making. Okay. 
Um, I would uh, give that credit to um, the Angias from Hikuan, uh, who started the whole tradition of pottery making vessels intended for the, the cultural, um, culturally interested, non-native and native, um, that was used to express an idea of when we have social dances like the Kuhina mm -hmm. or the Churkona, that the Atom would get together and to share their their identity through uh, cultural dances and cultural ceremonies. There, I would give them the credit for starting that tradition. More recently, um, in the last maybe 20, 30 years, that has been uh, picked up by the manuals, also from Nika One, who have also been making uh, uh, friendship pots in, in the tradition uh, established by the Angias. Also, like with myself as well, I started uh, experimenting with uh, making more decorative pieces, um, probably as back in the 90s when I first started returning back to making pottery again after have, having not done anything for probably a good 20 years. Right. So, and uh, we also have other people too that have recently come into our group of. Uh, Ton Open Potters, Harrison Preston from Sanavir, Kathy, of course, and Teresa Choyoa, who are also um, potters, um, um, working in just an experimentation and trying to create new forms or new kinds of, uh, of uh, decorative pottery. As far as utilitarian um, wear, I think that the difference between um, Dana Atam and uh, Nan Atam is that, um, you know, the Nan Atam would want to purchase those decorative pieces. Um, for, for a Dana Atam, the, the utilitarian wear and, and the actual usage of the vessel is, is, is the key. And I think that because they, they have have had um, maybe vessels that belong to their their grandparents and their great grandparents where where now they're 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 afraid to use them because right. they don't want to crack or or you know it it becomes an uh, a, an object on the shelf right. but um, so I was very fortunate to to uh, be introduced to Alicia but who um, who came from a generation of potters, uh, utilitarian potters, um, and to for her to pass this on, I mean that she was very passionate about making sure that this that her knowledge was going to be passed on when she left this this world, and and, and right. the same thing, with Ruben. I mean, I am so blessed to have met Ruben, and 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 everything that he shares with me. Um, but for for the utilitarian and and for the thanaat, then those pieces, those vessels, I I have uh, uh, started seeing uh, people wanting to purchase, so that they could get a taste of what the beans taste like, what the water tastes like, and and to um, so for them it's it's deep, it's really something deep, for for a non them. Um, it's 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 mostly for the shelf and to to um, to um, I, I guess as a as as a, a way of uh, showing that you know they've been to this region or right. or, or something in that manner. Or they but, know somebody. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. But it, it's a really special special type of vessel and. Right. Um, Right now, I, I guess because of the introduction of uh, metal and you know the pots and the pans, right. um, our, our our traditional utilitarian ware has kind of been put on the shelf for a, for for a little bit. Right. But we're here to make sure that um, we're gonna take those off the shelf now and we're gonna start using them. <laughs> and and using them. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. We're gonna do all that good stuff with them now. So um, I'm really, really thankful for Southwest Folk Alliance to giving giving us the opportunity to share this and and you know to um, to see um, it grow and to right. move forward. 
So that's the difference that I see with you utilitarian wear versus decorative. And, um, and, and Ruben is right. A lot of the um, ornamental um, friendship pots that you see um, yeah. does come from the Angia family or the uh, Hikwin area. Um, and I was actually asked to uh, asked if I could make a friendship pot a few months back. Um, uh -huh. And I, and I told the individual, if you want a friendship pot, like a white clay friendship pot, right. you really should go see the Angia family or right. uh, some Ikiwan area because that's kind of the, their trademark. Right. Um, for me, it's utilitarian. I mean, I could do something, but it's not going to look like what you want, what you're right. expecting. Right. Um, because I see that. I see that as well. So. Right. I also forgot something that I should have acknowledged way before, and that is that decorative pottery actually started um, from when the ladies would make uh, the the pots for the Nawi. Um, oh, yeah. And when you look at a lot of some of these these old pots, I love them, even though the the designs weren't immaculately placed or composed. Can, I love the excuse fact me, Ruben. That, before you go any further, can you can you explain what now it is very briefly so yes. that people understand? I will do my best, and if I don't give it the proper definition, then please join mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. The Nawith is a, a ceremony that the Tanahatan celebrate right after the Sawara harvest, where whereby the the autumn New Year is uh, begins uh, right around the same time that the Nawith. Uh, ceremony uh, occurs and what ha what is what usually ha generally happens is the, the the men would come together and they would take off they would uh, excuse me use some of the the syrup that was made from the 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 harvest of the the, the saguaro fruit and it would be mixed in with water and it would be allowed to ferment after it was fermented the nawiti da or the ceremony the rain ceremony wine ceremony would begin and the uh, the wine would be drunk by all the participants celebrating the new year and uh, you're more than welcome to add to that Bernard it's, I mean, it's also not not only is it not only does it mark our new year but it's, it's our prayer for rain ceremony mm -hmm. also so. so yeah I just wanted to you know right. put that out there because decorative pottery actually doesn't even have it its origin in the tourist market it actually has its origin in, in this wine ceremony because mm. these uh, wine jars would be made and they would be decorated with symbols of water, symbols of rain, uh, anything associated with the, the pulling down of the clouds and therefore the, the coming of the monsoon season and go. therefore a regeneration of the earth. I've heard mm. often people talk about some of the prayers that were done at the ceremonies and the way it was described to me from the autumn into either Spanish or English was that to watch the hair, the little green hairs of the earth come up from the ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've, we've touched on many things, but I have a final question. Um, you know, I've, I've heard elders talk about, about, about many things being our himadak. Um, we were we were interviewing a, an elder woman one time on on our discussion regarding the women's game of toka and uh, how she wanted to emphasize the fact that toka was not just a game but it was part of our way of life. Um, basket making is not just something that's made; it's part of our way of life. Can you can you relate that that idea? And you have in in several cases, but can you focus in on how you view uh, pottery making to be not just the not just resulting in a pot, but how that 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 whole process is a part of our himaduk? Do you want to go, Kathy? Um, sure. Um. It is true, like I had mentioned early on, about how um, how much pottery is a part of who we are as Tahuna Autumn. 
But to go even a little bit further than that, um, a lot of our 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 being as autumn. Um, for me, what what happens when we go get clay? Um, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, and 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 so that is for us. That's like. Um, uh, bringing us back to uh, where something's just not handed to you. You right. go and you work for it. So right. it, um, there's a lot of work involved in all of that before you even begin to work with the clay. Um, so it, it, it makes you strong as an individual, like you mentioned, uh, your grandmother uh, carrying carrying bucket a bucket of clay on her head. How many, how many, uh, People can you see doing that nowadays? Right. You know? um, so it, it strengthens not only our physical being, but right. emotional and spiritual being as well. Um, and, and I've heard Ruben shared this a lot with uh, with in the beginning when he would start uh, uh, or when he started making uh, clay with his his uh, with with his sword about, about being impatient. You know, wanting to uh, to get things done uh, fast, and 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 so it teaches you patience. Right. It teaches you a lot about, um, you know, because when you mix clay, you can't just work it right away. You got to let it sit and cure on its own. So, and so you have to take that time too to to settle um, and let the let the clay. Um, rest and and cure and do what it needs to so that way it can be workable um but us um we want to we live in that we live in a day and age where we want to see things right away we want yeah. we want to we want to see it done and and you know once we start we want to but with working with clay it kind of brings you back to um to peacefulness for me um but it also teaches you that no matter how much work you put into that pot, it will, it may break in the firing process. Right. And, and when that happens, it's okay. You start all over again. You just, that's what was instilled in me was that don't ever give up. If it breaks, uh, try it again. Just keep working because you're you're never going to know the outcome of your vessel after the firing, but you put so much work into the vessel, hoping that it's going to make it through the fire. And that's what you do in life, you know, life, life in general. So for me, clay has taught me a whole bunch of really of who I am and right. who I need to and, and how how important it is. And so it, there's a whole teaching behind just not only creating a vessel, but but whatever vessel that you create, your spirit is in that vessel as well. Yeah, so all the thoughts and the feelings and everything that you're you're going through while you're creating that vessel, mm -hmm. it's in there. That's why it was always shared. Um, to have those good thoughts when you're creating, to have that goodness, because when you give that vessel away, you're giving those feelings and those thoughts all, along with the pot um, right. to whoever gets it. So there's a whole bunch more than just creating a vessel. It, it, it goes really deep for us. Go ahead, Ruben. So yeah. What, what oh. I'm think, so what I'm thinking as I'm listening is that it, it does take a lot of hard work and a lot of patience but it also requires a lot of knowledge of the materials that you're using and the mixtures that, that, that are important, the correct types of mixtures that you, you need to consider. I mean, it's just, it's an, it's an amazing process. So I'm sorry, go ahead, Ruben. Oh, well, um, I was just gonna add to what Kathy said. Actually, I'm a very impatient person. And uh, I had you a and rough- I both. <laughs> I, had a rough, I had a rough beginning as a kid and uh, so pottery making uh, was a um, was one of my first um, means of uh, processing all the the stuff that I went through as a kid. 
but also it taught me patience and it was probably one of the only things that would allow me to sit down right. and just relax into right. what I was doing. So it was a wonderful teacher for me as a human being and as an awesome person. It right. taught me patience and, again, and also the acceptance of whatever the outcome was, whether it was good or bad. Um, yeah. Because when you go through all these experiences, you know, the first thing you want to think is, oh, this is against me and this is not meant for me. But I've always, I was always drawn to it ever since I was a kid. Uh -huh. So I knew something would come of it. Uh, and uh, it just becomes something that you learn to accept as you move on through your growth, not only as a human being, but as an artist. All right. Very good. Thank you very much for your... Thank you. Your comments is very enlightening. It's been really beautiful to um, to be here with you today, and um, as I'm I'm reflecting on um, some things that you touched on earlier, um, you know, I know early on in our conversations, Ruben and I, uh, Ruben had really reiterated the importance of understanding the role and place of pottery in the Hana Atam traditional arts and how it has always been a lesser known form uh, nationally, regionally, and um, yet we hear so much richness in the history of your families and of your own knowledge and the lineages and the mentors and mentees that you've become and you will become um, and so as we close, um, what are your final thoughts? If you were to put a message in a bottle and send it to the future, the Hana Atam youth, you know, the, the potters of the future, what would you tell? What would you share with them? Kathy, you want to go first? I will go first, but I might start crying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just lot. letting you know. It's a lot. I it's can feel lot. it right here. <laughs> uh, I think my message would say how important it is, how beautiful it is to know that you are creating, that you still have a connection to the past, and that you're the connection to the future. It is, it is, I'm just, I, I, I am blessed to have known Alicia and Ruben and to hear everything that they've shared and to know that I have a commitment to make sure that my children's children's children you're you're there and that you're you're continuing this this journey because you have to it's who we are as them i told you i was gonna cry <laughs> sorry <laughs> okay <laughs> okay sorry mm -hmm. um as far as a message in a bottle um it's who we are and it grounds us to this place that uh, we've called home for hundreds and thousands of years. Um, it also uh, is a direct connection back to the beginning, the beginning when the creator made us out of clay. Um, I would encourage those generations that come after us to continue to explore areas that we have never been explored. There's so much um, that has come about in the preparation, not only for this presentation, but also presentations that Kathy and I have done together. Uh, we've learned you know, all these names for all these forms. And whereas in the past, we never even thought about these things. I told Kathy too, to en encourage her to create her own terminology for these pieces that she creates, not to rely necessarily about others interpretations of what we've created. And I mean that mostly about forms and the way we uh, name them and the way we describe them. It's about empowerment. Um, I know a lot of native people talk about decolonizing 
And I think that uh, taking control by uh, inter our own interpretations and our own definitions is part of decolonization. And that needs to continue to grow and move forward as we um, progress into the next two, 300 years, 400, however long uh, we have on this earth. Thank you. Hmm. I guess if I guess if I had something to say, I'd, I'd go back to what that elder said about uh, the the art or the, the the process of making pottery is 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 not just a process. It's it's who we are, as you mentioned. It's our himadak, Uh I guess that would be my message in a bottle. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> Thank you. Right. So in closing, I just want to remind our audiences that. If you have any other questions or you want to reach out to either Bernard or Ruben or Kathy, uh, let us know. We're happy to share their email addresses for, for future reflection or conversations. And as Bernard mentioned earlier on in stories about his grandmother, in addition to being uh, a tradition that is integral to the, the, the cultural expressions of being Atham, the, um, there is an economic marketplace for this work. So you can find, uh, Kathy has a pot on our Tucson Meet Yourself folk art marketplace that you can purchase. And there are also two other mentees of Rubens who've um, kindly shared their work with us. And there are things that you can, you can purchase and, um, and bring into your own homes. You can make to hold water or cook beans. <laughs> Or, um, or sit on shelves. I think all three of them are, are for the purposes of utilitarian use. So mm -hmm. um, I just want to thank you again for being here and for blessing our Tucson Meet Yourself Reframe Festival with the first Traditions Tuesday conversation. Um, I'm humbled to know each of you and I've learned so much in this conversation. And I hope all of you who are tuning in today have also felt the same. Thank you. And, and thank you, thank Leo, you. for all that you provided for us to allow us to get our voices out there. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And cut.